Then a warm welcome again, and let's start. So, David, I'm uh, leaving the the scene over to you. All right, thank you, Anna. Uh, maybe I can just mention. I saw some uh, discussion in the chat. Uh, if you see someone joining and they cannot hear anything, I think they might need to take Gustav's advice there. You might have to join with your microphone enabled, which is quite a curious mechanism of WebEx. So if you see someone writing in the chat that they can't hear anything, uh, please tell them to try to rejoin and activate their microphone while they do so. Okay, so I'm David Zwieberg. I'm a C++ developer at Sensact, and I've been here uh, almost from the start of what used to be Sensact. Uh, we used to be called Senuity. It started in 2017, and I've been doing development in sensor fusion area since then. And sensor fusion is, is an algorithmic area where we try to take information from different sensors of the environment. And a sensor of the environment could be uh, vision, which uh, Eric will talk about. And vision, if we go quickly into that, is trying to capture uh, object states or, or similar from, from a camera or a video. Like, is there a pedestrian in the video? Try to forward that information. And in sensor fusion, we take input from different sensors that have different strengths and weaknesses and try to combine that data in the challenging association problem to make a better view of the environment for, for the features and functions that want to act on objects in the environment. So today I'm not going to speak about that, but I can mention that uh, we have a strong C++ community in SESACT. We have a C++ forum that we have been running for almost three years, which is open for everyone uh, in the company to join and participate. And there we discuss like uh, what standards we want to follow. Since we're doing safety critical development, uh, we have been following starting with MISRA a few years ago, but the MISRA is, is an is a international standard that gives rules to, to yield a subset of C++ that is inherently safer than if you have all the tools to shoot yourself in the foot. But MISRA hasn't released a new C++ standards in 2008, so we have now switched to Autosar C++14 guidelines to allow using C++14. But we're hoping, uh, there are some rumors that MISRA will release a new standard for C++14 and 17 sometime soon. Maybe someone in here knows more. And then we hope that we can step to C++17 at least. But uh, we will leave C++14 for now and move towards C++20 to look at uh, some smaller features that might be shadowed by the four big ones. And I can also mention that we had a meetup with Gibby SAP about two or three years ago uh, where Dog spoke. I don't know if, if Dog is joining today, but uh, yeah, it was also very interesting. And I hope we can maybe have a, a shorter cadence than that until our next meetup. Okay. So if we look at the agenda today, we will look at three features. I will try to keep them a bit hidden to, to have some excitement and also to try to get some um, um, collaboration with you in the audience. I will stop a little now and then and try to ask questions and have a look in the chat. And then after each feature, I will also stop for at least a few questions. We will see how the time schedule is, but Eric, uh, who is last, has promised that it's okay if we run over a bit, uh, if we're interested for that. So uh, feel free to post questions in the chat. When I'm looking left like that, I'm looking down on my my other, my third. Yeah, um, it is a lot of dog fever in here, uh, WebEx tricks. So we're going to start with feature A, which uh, has a curiosity factor that is somewhat low, but I think it's quite useful to know about. Then we're going to go to uh, another feature, which has a slightly higher curiosity factor, but slightly lower usefulness factor. And then we're going to go into the feature C, which is uh, really curious and probably really useless, but uh, really instructive to learn about. And if we have time, we will have some bonus slides. Okay, so let's jump into feature A. We're going to start to look at this class template here. Uh, so it has a data member called nValue, which just store its single non-type template parameter called n. And it's const, so it doesn't change beyond the initialization of an object of a particular specialization of, of this number class template. It also has a static data member called value, which does the same thing, but it's tied to the type and not to objects of it. And then it has a factory method that we're supposed to use to, to create objects that can ever only store the value n that is representative of their specialization. So it's quite a contrived class. 
but the, the, the API designer here has done their best to make sure that you shouldn't try to construct anything else than this dummy object that only holds the value of its representative template argument for its uh, non-template parameter. So the, the author here has claimed that for any object, say number, of a specialization of the number class template, the following invariant is true. That the member always has the same value as the static data member. So it's saying that the member of this guy always has the same value as this guy for any, any specialization of number. And it's given that we don't explicitly specialize it, so we don't do any hacks that way. Okay, so uh, here's the first question for the chat. Does this claim hold? I will wait one minute and see if we have any, any guesses. And meanwhile, I can answer Oliver's uh, question that... Uh, All right. Yeah, we, we need to have a compiler that is qualified for C++14, but it's not as simple as saying qualified because there are also the question of what about standard libraries, what about the subset of standard library, but that is one of the things that we face in our C++ forum and try to, to solve. But at least that it compiles and does its translation uh, as promised is a requirement if we're going to do any ASIL development, uh, which is a security standard. Uh, we didn't get any answers from the chat yet. I will wait another few seconds. Yeah, it, it holds in C++11. It doesn't hold in 14. It doesn't hold in 17 and it holds in 20. So this is the, the core of the first feature, uh, confusion that we hopefully resolve in 20. And the key here is that this is actually well formed in C++14. We can create an object of the specialization which passes one as the template argument to the non-template parameter. And if we looked at the, at the definition of the class, we would expect that the data member would be the same as the template parameter one. But here we're actually using aggregate initialization so we initialize the data member to 42. And the static data member, of course, uh, is still the same as the template parameter. And this can be really confusing that we can override deleted and private constructors by means of aggregate initialization. And this has changed over the different standards also. And we will look into what is actually an aggregate class over the different standards. But yes, this is the highlight. So Let's move on and start looking at, I think we're going to, usually we would start with what, but we're going to start with why here. Uh, and initialization in C++ is very complex, so we'll try, we'll try not to dig too deep into it, but when we use list initialization, I either direct list in it, we have some type and we have some object. If this type class is an aggregate class, then list initialization, either by direct list in it or copy list in it, is aggregate initialization. And aggregate initialization is very special because it short circuits constructors uh, to initialize non-static data members. Uh, and back in the days, we usually spoke about PODs, plain old data, and this is not the same thing. Uh, I used to think that they were almost, I mean, the only thing that is an aggregate is a pod, but yeah, the rules for aggregates have have changed and are a bit confusing. And since we short circuit access, uh, short circuit constructions, the constructors, then the access restrictions on constructor is also relevant. And that is why we can, can skip that there's a private cons default constructor and, and just construct an object with a specific value for the data member anyway. So then we're going to what, what qualifies as an aggregate. And I guess we'll have to see for the different variants of the standards to, to see why, what have changed for, the reason for why do we end up in this yes, no, no, yes here. Okay, so we're going to start with C++11. And I'm going to share this uh, presentation later, so you can go into these links if you like to dig deeper. And uh, there will be other links also, so I will share it uh, at the meetup page afterwards, as well as in the chat. And what is interesting here, there's a lot of text, but what we want to learn is that an aggregate is a class with no user provided constructor. And user provided here is, if we just think about it, it sounds like, okay, you don't, 
provide any constructors, but just to provide that it's a standardized term that says that a special member is usually provided if it is not explicitly defaulted or deleted on its first declaration. So if we recall this example, this is a similar one. Here we have a class named A, and it is defaulted on its first declaration. Then this is not user provided. So A here is an aggregate class. But confusingly, we can default constructors out of line, and then it is not defaulted on its first declaration. So B here is not an aggregate class. And even more confusingly, if we use braced initialization for A, since it's an aggregate class, it will be aggregate initialization. And we're not going to dig into the rules, but that means that the member A is value initialized. And it will result in it being zero initialized to zero. But for B, on the other hand, value initialization is default initialization. And the default constructor, the explicitly defaulted here, it doesn't do anything to initialize the member B. So then the member B is default initialized, and since it's a fundamental type, it has an internal value. So if we read B.B B here, we have undefined behavior. Yeah, so, so aggregates, uh, really confusing. And uh, the takeaway here is man, be careful if you ever use explicitly defaulted uh, constructors out of line. Okay, so we're going to go to 14 and see what changed for aggregates. We also had a little term here that says it has no brace or equal initializers for non-static data members. And a brace or equal initializer, uh, we don't have it here, but uh, we can go back to that later. It also goes on the term of default member initializers. So we can, we can return to that later, but that is what changed for 14. And the class template number that we looked at before, it used a default member uh, initializer to initialize its data member and value. So that is what changed that made it an aggregate in C14 when it was not one in 11. And if we go to 17, uh, it is still the same with user provided. It shouldn't have a user provided. It also adds this uh, a bit curious keyword that the constructor sh shouldn't be explicit. And then there's uh, uh, some other things that we don't want to care about here. So it doesn't change so much between 14 and 17, but we have this explicit weirdness that we might have a quick look at. Okay, so we're just gonna dig into what, why would explicit be barring a type from being an aggregate? So in this case, this guy is an aggregate in C++ 11, 14, and 17. This guy is an aggregate in C++ 11 and 14, but not in 17, okay. So we have an explicitly deleted explicit constructor and it's no longer an aggregate. The confusion gets higher. And we could dig into a lot of, of library working group issues and, and core working group issues where, where aggregates and aggregate confusion has been present. So we are just gonna quickly go over, over this, but the reason why this explicit was added was because this is from the library working group issue 2510, which was one of the drivers for, for this change, is that if you have tag types, you usually, you want to use tags to, to choose overloads. So overload one here should be the one you usually choose unless you use an ex a tag type on the call site. But in C++14, this call was ambiguous because the allocator types are aggregates. So it, it could be to aggregate initialization of this guy. So we're not gonna dig deeper there, but the summary is that because one, tag types were aggregates, and two, copy list initialization allows to use non-explicit constructors, we ended up with these ambiguous situations. And the resolution was that all these allocator or these tag types now have explicit constructors to A, not be aggregates, and to B, not allow copy list initialization uh, with the empty braces. Okay, I will take a question now. So it is user-defined, Shell asks here. Uh, let's uh, see. Do you want me to read the questions for you? I can read it out loud here. So Shell writes, so it is user-defined. If you do something that prevents the compiler and linker, we can go back to this guy. Uh, to do its default stuff. So out of line default prevents the compiler to inline it. Uh, 
to be honest, I, I can't answer that, but we can defer it to later. Uh, I will only fall back on the rule that says that if it is if it is not inline defaulted, then it will not be an aggregate. But remember that if you do out of line, then it could be defined in a source file and it's declared in a header. So the compiler wouldn't know uh, just looking at the class uh, definition that it's an uh, explicitly defaulted constructor. Uh, I would guess that that has something to do with it. But if someone else has something to answer, please write in the chat or we can take it later. Okay. Okay, we're going to leave this issue, but now we know that they added explicit for a reason uh, to sort out some confusion with open uh, core working group and library working group tickets. So then we reached feature A. Uh, you can click this link and it prohibits aggregates with user declared constructor with emphasis on declared here. So if we look at the definition of an aggregate in C20, they have stricken user provided and say that if you only declare it, it will no longer be an aggregate. And this makes a lot more sense uh, in my view. Of course, they no longer need to mention explicit because if you can't even declare it, you can't mark it explicit. So these examples, they were all aggregates in C++ 11 to 17, 14 to 17, 14 to 17. Remember, because here you have the default member initializer, which means that this is not an aggregate in 11. But as of C20, they are all non-aggregates, which means that whilst this was well-formed in C14 and 11, it's now ill-formed. In the case of A, we are trying to use a deleted constructor. It's no longer aggregate initialization. In the case of B, we are trying to use a private constructor. In the other case, we are trying to use aggregate initialization to override the default member initializer here. And there's no constructor that will allow us to do that. And in the case of C, it's similar to, to here. We, have, we don't have a constructor which takes a number and we can't override it with aggregate initialization. Okay, so we're at feature B. Uh, we can stop now and see if we have some more questions on aggregates. Otherwise, we jump into feature B. Feel free to jump in and either write your questions or unmute yourselves. While we wait, I can just clarify that when we say declare, it means that we don't even need to provide an explicitly de deleted definition. Even if we just write a semicolon here and never provide a definition, it is declared. That is what is so good with this proposal that we we don't get this uh, confusing mixed cases. If you even try to declare it, it will be uh, no longer be an aggregate. Okay, no questions. I can stop otherwise. I'm having my eyes on the chat. Okay, so feature B. Let's have a little snippet of code here. So we have a class template called foo, which has a single type template parameter t, and it has a single data member of that type template parameter. Now we also have a function template called add to foo, which takes two arguments. Uh, one which is uh, a non const reference to an object of type foo for some specialization, given the specialization of the function template. And then we also have a value, which should then supposedly be the same value as foo is storing. And it tries to add the value to the public data member of foo. Okay. Now, if we look at this call, let's ask the chat, what do we think will happen when we try to we instantiate an object of the, inst the specialization where the type template parameter to foo is long? We set it to value 42, the data member, and then we try to call add to foo. We try to add 13 to 42 via our utility function here. Any takers and um, also make sure uh, or be encouraged to, to speak up your question also if you feel that it takes too long to write. People write compiler ah, error. Yeah, we got some uh, compiler errors. Yes, and Arvid here has the correct term. So this one compiles, but this one doesn't. As Arvid says, 
we're going to get an error that says that we have no match matching function for add to foo. And if we're going to go through quickly, what happens here is that when we call add to foo here, we trigger name lookup, and it only finds one one function with the name add to foo. And then we go into template argument deduction to try to deduce for this function templates the arguments. Basically, you want to deduce what is the template argument for for add to foo given this function. Uh, the, the arguments to these function parameters. So in this case, we kind of have two sources of information to deduce a single argument. And the problem here is that when it looks at the first argument, that is full long, it deduces t to long. But when it looks at the other argument, it looks at 13 with no suffix and it deduces it to int. So we get an error that you're deducing different conflicting types for the template argument. And this means that this guy is thrown away from overload from the viable candidates. It's it's not considered a viable candidate, and then overload resolution fails because we don't have any other candidate that might be viable. Okay. We could of course just add a little L here. And then both these function arguments will deduce the template argument to long. But this is not what we might have intended when we constructed this API. So what we can do instead is that we can look at something called non-deduced context. And what is long-deduced context? Well, first of all, it says that if template parameters are in non-deduced context, they do not participate in template argument deduction. And then we ask, what are the non-deduced context? And this is a long list if you want to go into it, but it says that the nested name specifier of a type that was specified using a qualified idea is a non-deduced context. So if we had a look here at, yeah, I see Christian wrote, of course, we can also spe specify explicitly what is the, Christian says that another way to, to come around this is that you could explicitly add here at the call site your uh, template argument, add to foo bracket long end bracket, and then there will be no remaining uh, template arguments to deduce because it has already been explicitly specified. But we will not want to do that either. We want to look into non-deduced context. So here we have a, a structure bar. It has a simple uh, type alias in it, just saying that type is int. And this is just so we can try writing up what is a qualified name. Bar colon colon type here is a qualified name. And the grammar for a qualified name says the rightmost entry here to the rightmost colon is an unqualified idea and everything else is a nested name specifier. So then we can go back here. It says that the nested name specifier of a type, that is a non-deduced context. So if we somehow can, can get a template parameter to end up in this part, it will not be deduced as part of template argument deduction. And then we can use a, a hack called the identity hack, or not a hack, it's a more of a well-known mechanism, I guess. But we can we can implement this template function that we would we would call it a transformation trait or a meta function with a simple purpose. It takes a single type template parameter and it stores it in a type alias, an alias declaration called type. And this seems kind of useless at first. Why would we take a type and store it as its identity? But this is very useful because if we put this, this identity trait into an argument to a template function, then now we recognize what we saw up here, right? We see that we have a qualified ID here and the template parameter is part, or the template argument is, is part of the of the leftmost part that we said was the nested name specifier. So this T here is actually in a non-deduced context. We wouldn't be able to call this F unless we specify what T we're referring to. And of course, we don't want to write type name all the time, so we use a little uh, alias template here to use the, to add a template for it. Okay, now we have something to work with. So let's go back to the to this add to foo function template and try to rewrite it. Okay, instead of taking a foo 
of some specialization and directly taking the value that we think should match with food. We basically say that, and we could do this the other way around also, that, okay, the value, I don't want the value to participate in template argument deduction. I want to type here the, the template argument to be entirely deduced from the first function argument, foo. And here, as we said before, it doesn't change just because we have an alias template. It is the same as here. And we can now call foo in our original example without an error because this guy doesn't participate in template argument deduction. Okay, so t is unambiguously deduced to long from foo and 13 is promoted when we call it. And uh, I don't know if I should mention it, but sometimes you see that people implement uh, this identity function using the common type trait. And this uh, is good to know that the common type trait contains, it's also, it's another type trait. It is a, a type trait from the standard library. It exists at least in C++ 17. I don't know at the top of my head if it's even earlier, but this, you might think that if I take the common type of myself, I should get that type. That should be the identity. But the common type actually uses uh, decay in its definition. So if we take the common type of, for example, int const, the type is actually not int const, it's int. So do not define your identity transformation trait using common type. Okay. So this is feature B, the identity meta function. It is not called identity, it's called type identity. And it even mentions in, in the paper that it's, it's, it can be used to selectively disable template argument deduction, which is what we just uh, covered. And it's quite fun to, to read the paper because they explicitly point out that the main issue with standardizing this utility has long been the lack of consensus on the name. And I think uh, all of us have been in meetings uh, doing bike shedding, if you have heard the term uh, bike shedding is I think it's derived from when a nuclear plant was going to design a big important building in the nuclear plant and a bike shed. But because most people didn't have competence to participate in the discussion about the important building, most time was spent discussing the bike shed because everyone had something to say about the bike shed. So there's probably been a lot of bike shedding on type identity, but now we have it. And uh, so it's from C++20, you don't have to write your own identity transformation trait. Okay. Now we have uh, reached feature C. So before we do that, we could take another time if someone wants to ask some questions. I see that Oliver was quicker than me to point out that we have type identity in C20. So do we have any questions before we proceed to the high curiosity, uh, low usefulness feature? I guess people will sum up at the end. Yes, we will take some time afterwards uh, when we have let this sunk in. So feature C, as I said, uh, at least how we're going to use it now is uh, high curiosity and we might learn a thing or two about templates. Uh, it's a minus here because what we learn here, at least how this is used, uh, you should not use that in product code, but uh, see this as a journey that might be instructive and maybe something you want to use in tests. So some might be able to guess where we're going. We're going to talk about friends before we get into the feature that we're looking for. So here is a class which has a friend function, a void function called f, and it also has a private function, static private function called h. And we can see that when we define f, it has access to the private function. This is just a classical use of friend. And if you're not uh, aware of what the friend is, it basically gives access to entities such as function and classes that can waive the access mechanisms that are typically part of the class S here. I mean, I wouldn't be able to call SH from a namespace scope, for example, but F is a friend, so it can do that. Now, what you might not know about friend or might know if you have looked at friend operators is that you can also define a friend uh, at its friend declaration. So this is a friend declaration. This is an out of line definition of the friend, but you can move this guy up here. And then you also have the property that the friend will be inline. And we will return to the inline, but for now, we will also mention that a friend defined and its declaration has the lexical scope of the class. So 
at this point, we need to qualify the name to H and say that this is the age of the S. But if we define it at its friend declaration, it can call H directly because it's in the lexical scope of the class. Okay, but now we might, how are we going to call this guy? If we try to call it, it says F is not declared in this scope. And there's a special, a special note here that if you have a friend declaration, uh, especially if you have defined it, it doesn't make it visible to unqualified lookup, even if it has namespace scope. So lookup won't be able to find this guy just by its in-class definition. But there's a non-normative note that says the name of the friend will be visible if it's namespace, if there's a matching declaration on namespace scope. So we can look at this example. Don't look at G for now. Let's just look at F. We have a matching declaration at namespace scope. Lookup will find F and we'll use the definition from here. There's also another that we will not go into here. It's not uh, relevant for this part, but you can also find friends via argument dependent lookup. I'm not going to go into argument dependent lookup if you don't know what it means, uh, other than mentioning that it, it, it's a mechanism that is totally parallel to qualified and unqualified lookup that looks at the types of the argument to function call to bring in stuff. And it, there's a lot of gotchas and things there, and it's quite interesting to look up, uh, read up on, uh, but we will not go into that here. So what's important is that, okay, as long as we redeclare the friend, we can find it via uh, what we, we can call the regular lookup. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Remember the last slide, we, we said we have a struct, uh, a non-class template which has a friend. Nothing prohibits us from placing a friend declaration in a class template. And more so, we can just as well define it inline and just make it visible for lookup at namespace scope. It's still not so weird this, but now we will come to the, to the tricky part. So consider this now a single source code. This definition of F, it will not be, I, would not, I don't even know the normative term for this, but it will not be instantiated if you will, or it will not be available until you have either explicitly or implicitly instantiated some specialization of A. So if we look at G here, which is a similar friend function to the class template B as F is to A, if we try to call G without any implicit or explicit instantiation of the class template B, there will be no definition of it. It will say, this is an undefined reference to the G function. Whereas if we instantiate A, for example, we will also have the definition of F. And this is the first time I read this, I was like, oh, okay, this, this sounds weird. Especially what happens if we instantiate A twice? Yeah, we get a redefinition error. So every time we instantiate A, it will try to redefine F. And basic ODR says that no translation unit should contain more than one definition of any function. So this means that any given translation unit cannot instantiate A more than once, implicitly or explicitly, for, for like more than one specialization. Uh, I'll, elsewhere, we will redefine this guy. And moreover, every, every translation unit that wants to use F needs to instantiate it at least once. So we have a an equality system there that says, if you want to use it, you must explicitly or implicitly instantiate the class template exactly once, all right? Okay, now let's go even further. Let's realize that nothing contrib uh, is, is stopping us from using uh, the template arguments for the template parameters, uh, or the template parameters, sorry, in the definition of F. So here we're, we're using the fact that, okay, I want to define F based on the specialization that is first and only instantiated in a given translation unit. We will also set up a similar example where we add a non-type template parameter to, to B. The only essence here is that we want to have an example where the single uh, non-type template parameter is used in F or every template parameter to this class template is used in the definition of the friend. And then we will have an example where only one or not all template parameters are used in the definition of the friend. Okay, let's say we have translation unit uh, represented by the source file CPP, which includes these two guys. 
And then it instantiates A1 implicitly by creating an object of it. So when we do this, we will define the friend F as int x1, okay? Then we do the same for B. Here we also pass uh, the non-type template parameter, which is not used in the definition of G. So the definition of F field will look the same. It will have int x1, okay? Then we have another translation unit, which does the same, but it changes the type template parameter for the class template B. Now this is okay, because the, this, this type template parameter is not used in the definition of the friend. So what is actually happening here is that this friend is defined both in, in both these translation units. But I said before that friends that are defined at their friend declarations, they are implicitly inline. And the rules say that an inline function can have multiple definitions in multiple translation units as long as the definitions are all the same. So at the moment we're safe because this guy will instantiate A1 and generate, or how we were to call it, a definition of F that has a one here, right? And this will do the same for G and both these translation units will generate definitions that are the same. So we haven't broken uh, ODR yet. But now what happens? We have a third translation unit. And here we actually instantiate another specialization of each of the class templates when we refer to the, to the, the non-type template parameter that is actually used to define these friends. And this is ill-formed, no diagnostic required. So the compiler will not help you out here, but you will have undefined behavior. So we might ask ourselves, what are we even doing in this domain? Why are we trying to, to create these dangerous friends? But we shall see. I will pause now and see, I see that Shell Uwe is writing. Yeah, it seems like a note, we can get back to that later, but uh, Yes, uh, do we have any, any questions on this slide? It, it was quite a lot on this slide, so I will pause here for some time before we proceed. Oh yeah, now I understood what Shilove said, that basically it would be nice if we had a mechanism to say that uh, you should only define F for the first instantiation. And then it should not be changed. But that would, uh, we will uh, return to that later. I will only say core working group issue 2118, and let's see that later. Okay, we go to the next slide. Now I want to talk about explicit instantiation definitions. And it's likely that many have not heard about this word. It's not used so often. But to understand it, let's have a look at this class template with a single type template parameter. That type template parameter is used to de declare uh, the data member of that type. It also has a member function template. So you have a member function template of the class template, which has another type template parameter. And then we have a function template. The reason why these are enumerated is just so we're gonna have a, a look, quick look at different template entities with regard to the term explicit instantiation definitions. So most of you who have worked with templates, I hope are are working with implicit instantiations because that is like the strength of templates. We, 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 and it's also what we have been doing the last few slides. We can start, uh, create, instantiate an object here uh, of a specialization of the class template S where the, the type template parameter is char. So this will implicitly instantiate this specialization S char. And likewise, if we call the member function template of this particular specialization of S class template with a one, then the one this will be deduced as integral literal, so u will be deduced here to an integer. And then this will implicitly instantiate the h int specialization for the s char specialization. Okay? And this case is similar. Here we just use the syntax that Christian showed us before when we were looking at the add to foo example, where we explicitly provide uh, the template argument for the single type template parameter of this function template which means that one will not do anything to deduce here because we have already gotten all the info we need for the single template argument here. So this will instantiate f int. Okay, this is, is nothing weird with regard to instantiations. This is how we usually use 
the templates, uh, and many of us might use it without even realize it when we use the standard containers, particularly the modern ones where we have a class template argument structure. But we're not going to go into that. So explicit instantiation definitions, that is a way to instantiate the template without having to fall back on these implicit mechanisms. So if we were to compare the syntax for, for an explicit instantiation of the S char specialization of the S class template looks like this. There is also a term called explicit instantiation declarations, but we will not visit that. It, it's even less common. Uh, and then if we want to look also at, we can talk, start with number three, it's more common. For the function template, it just looks like this. Looks kind of like a function uh, de declaration, but this will then explicitly instantiate the same guy as we saw here. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, slideware. So if you wonder what F is, it is foo. A little typo there. Thank you, Victor. Okay. And then we have the, the perhaps most complex guy. We said this is a member function template of a class template. We can also explicitly instantiate particularly the age int specialization of the S char specialization. So this only says like, what is this? We haven't really gone into to why do we use this? But before we're gonna do that, I'm just gonna highlight some dangers with explicit instantiation definitions. Use this with care uh, until, you, until you read up on them, okay? So it says that for a given template, let's say S, and a given set of template arguments, let's say char, an explicit instantiation definition shall appear at most once in a program. So if this appears more than once, uh, we will have, we will see it quite lately, ill-formed, no diagnostic required. So for this reason, you should very, very seldom see explicit instantiation definition in headers. We will also mention that an explicit specialization, which we will come to later, it can be defined at most once in a program, but it falls under ODR, uh, the thing we used for the, the inline function before. So this mentions defined. And the one definition rules, it actually allows us some leeway here, as like it might be defined several times, but as long as the definition is the same, it is considered to be defined once. But the explicit instantiation is very hard. It says appear. It doesn't say that you, you can't use it. it it's basically it says it must appear once. Then we have some grayed out here, uh, which I'm not gonna go into, but it basically says that if you start mixing explicit instantiations and explicit specializations, then you are on, on really, in really dangerous ground. I'm just gonna summarize this with this limerick from temp x plus pis. When writing a specialization, be careful about its location or to make it compile will be such a trial as to kindle its self emulation. I think it's the only poem I found in the standard. So uh, yes, take care with explicit instantiation definitions and definitely take care if you try to mix them with explicit specializations. You've got some questions here, um, David. Yes, we're gonna look here. Uh, we have from Christian asking, can age be explicitly instantiated even if S char hasn't? Uh, on the top of my head, I would say no, but someone could try it out in one box uh, while we're having this presentation. But I would think that you first need to explicitly instantiate uh, the S char, and then you would need to explicitly instantiate the specializations of these member function templates. So my guess is that this only uh, does the specialization of the member function template for this particular specialization of the class template. But someone please check it out and see if GCC or Clan can agree on this. Uh, then we had another question. What are the advantages of explicit instantiation templates? And that's a good question. We will go to that next slide, so I will postpone it. We also have shell. I think HT does not exist until ST is instantiated. Yes, I think that is a good interpretation. So we will see if someone can do this in one box and we can return to it in a slide. And Arvid mentioned something that we will have a look at in the example. Okay. So let's have a look at this, another class template, right? This is a, is a header that is intended for 
and this is just one example of how we might use explicit instantiation definitions. But let's say we have a header core SH, and this is exposing a class to, to like a public API to clients. And it's using, it's wrapping stuff in the detail namespace to, to kind of tell clients, this is not part of the public API. What we are exposing for you is this specialization. You should even, might not even have to consider this a template. It's a class called S. And it has a function, a member function called F. And this one is then the specialization of this S impl for the argument, the type template parameter set to a type argument that is a utility that we have in another class. This is not part of the public API, so this is an implementation detail. And this just says, okay, I'm printing up F here. We will see that later. And if you haven't seen this before, uh, we've looked at a lot of class templates, but we have not used this. This says that the default template argument for this non for this type template parameter is SUtil, which is this class. That means that if we don't provide uh, a, a template argument for this class template, we will be using the default argument instead. Okay, now. Uh, there are different ways to name this, but what you might want to highlight here is that in the class template, and this is quite uncommon, right? We have a class template, but the definition of its member function is missing. So this means that if, if someone were to, to use this public header and try to instantiate F without anything else, it would say undefined reference to S impl whatever argument to use and F, because there's no definition here. So where is the definition? Why is it not in the header that we might ask ourselves? Because usually we see all the definitions of the templated entities, if I'm to use a gathering term, in the headers. So we have broken out something called s -timple. I think Christian might be familiar with this particular pattern. It's the one that we'll be using on Sensac for the few occasions where we use this pattern. But there are, as Arvid says, sometimes you, you call this a CPP file. We will see later that this is actually included. So in some variations of this, you see inclusion of CPP files. And uh, that just says something of how uncommon this pattern is, but it can be good to know about. So we have basically broken out uh, the definition of the member function of the class template S to its own header. And this one is not something that the client should be using. The client should be using this guy. And then in the, in the translation unit that relates to the header file that the client is using, there we see this explicit instantiation definition. And you see that this, this CPP file is not including the S header, it's including the Timple header, which in turn is including the, uh, the S header. And this is it's a way to, it's a twofold thing. The first thing is that if you, if you use a lot of templates that includes header files that use templates, you can end up in, in template hell. And when you want to recompile, it takes a really long time because everything propagates and, and you get this huge translation unit, which brings in a lot of, of template prototypes, so to speak, that are instantiated in a single master translation unit. So explicit instantiation definitions uh, and particularly declarations, which we're not going through now, can be used to, to, to tell the compiler that I don't want you to instantiate this up, up the line. I'm explicitly instantiated myself. So this instantiation, which is using the default argument here, will be instantiated in the S translation unit and not in the translation unit that the clients are using. So we see that the S here is looking more and more like just a typical non-template clause. Uh, I have not, uh, Shell always asking me, how does the C++ modules affect the Timple paradigm? Uh, I am yet to read up on modules, so I cannot answer that, but maybe someone else uh, in the chat can do it. Thanks for the question. Okay, now when we look at the client, the client just includes the S header and he doesn't even or she need to care about whether this is a class template. It uses S like it's a regular template. It invokes the F data member and we see that we print F here. Okay, so we have said that one good thing here is that we, we can defer, or we can avoid the, this template instantiation propagating up into a huge translation unit that will take a long time to, to compile. But it will also, it can also facilitate mocking because in tests, if F is very large for some um, reason, we can actually replace 
the utility function. Remember, sutil is part of our production code. It is this class here. But while we are testing f, we might want to mock outgoing calls to, for example, the utility. So we can inject another type here that might go to a mock. And then we wonder, but the client, we don't have access to the definition of the member template. But during test, then you would include the temple, just like the client translation, or sorry, the, the product translation unit that does. So here we included the S temple, and then we did an explicit instantiation definition of the product intent template argument. In test, we can include our mock. This is uh, now uh, a stub, but you get the point. And we can do the same. We do an explicit instantiation definition, but we use the mock as the argument. And then we can test this instantiation of S and argue that, that this tests uh, the production intent S sufficiently, but it mocks outgoing calls. And of course, here you might need to make an argument if you're in safety critical code, because we're actually testing another specialization of S than the one used in the product code. But uh, I will leave that for, for that argument. Yeah, and if we call this, we will be calling the mock. Okay, so this was one example of how you can use explicit instantiation definitions. Another one would be that perhaps you know beforehand uh, that your templated entity should ever only be called over a set of given types, maybe typical integer types. And then you can also, also break it out because your API might not be intended to be used by other types. And you also want to make sure that if you already know this set, why not compile it in a translation unit that needn't propagate up to, to other to client translation units. I saw we also got a comment from Victor here. Ah, yeah, you can use explicit template instantiation in template metaprogramming to break recursive template instantiation. I think Albin did that some years ago. It's not something I'm aware of myself, but uh, that sounds like it's probably possible. You can do a lot of hacks with explicit instantiation definitions. Okay, so then we are, we are done with explicit instantiation definitions for now, and we're gonna get to the core of this feature or rather what we did before we had this new feature. And this is in temp explicit slash tell, we have 12, we have this quite uh, special thing. It says that the usual access checking rules, it doesn't apply to names used to specify explicit instantiations. And this is, uh, I mean, deep down in the standard, but Johannes Schaub, he, he realized this, maybe someone did it before him, but I think that's the first time I read about it. That this means, if we just apply this before we go to, to Johannes' approach, it means that if you have a class which has a private data member X, and then you have a class template, here we have a, a deduced uh, non-type template parameter. It can take any valid non-type template parameter and it will be, its type will be deduced and it will take its value. So then you can, in an explicit instantiation definition, you might actually use private names. So this is a pointer to data member to X, and X is private here, but this is well formed because of this rule. And if we combine this with what we, we just learned about friends, then we can access private data members before C20, and it's well formed, even if we shouldn't <laughs> do it. So yeah, you can read Johannes' original blog post from 2011, I think. We're gonna quickly go through it. How are we looking on time? You are running a bit uh, over time. You should have been done six minutes ago. But okay. uh, it's fine. We, we have planned some buffer time anyway. So uh, yeah. you can go a bit, a bit too. Okay. Yeah, so we will run through this quite quickly. But let's have, say we have a class template which has private members and private member functions and private data members. Then we can use what we have learned about explicit instantiation definitions and about friends to define a friend. You re remember this, we define a friend at its friend declaration. We make use of the template uh, parameter in the definition of the friend. And then we use the fact that we can actually, as part of an explicit instantiation definition, we can inject the private entity. So when we do this explicit instantiation definition, we will be creating a namespace scope function, which take the S and which actually 
invokes the private function f on that s. Uh, this can, it might take uh, some time to digest, but we can do the same for, uh, of course, the data member. Here we are using the same thing. We are defining this private, uh, this, this friend function, and here we similarly inject the definition which takes the type template, uh, the non-type template parameter to access uh, and actually get a non-const reference to its non-const arguments. So this is a way to access private data members and even modify them using friends and explicit instantiation definitions. And here we have a small demo. We create a, a instance of S. We invoke the, the F function, which prints, uh, returns G, and we see that it is 42 as per its default member initializer. And then we increase its value, and it's 43. Okay, there are a lot of gotchas that we haven't gone through before, but if another another translation unit includes this, this access private of S header that we have here, then we will be violating what we said before, that an explicit instantiation definition for a given set of template arguments should not appear more than once. And we can also see that these guys are specific for every member. We, we create a struct for the S member, we create a struct for the X member. Okay, so what can we do to solve that? The typical approach is that you create an uh, unnamed namespace and you place it in a header, also quite uncommon. This namespace will be unique to each translation unit. And then you use this one as a tag type. So even if you have this explicit instantiation definitions in header, because the tag type will be unique to each translation unit, it means that the template, this explicit instantiation definition will be unique to each translation unit. But the tag type is not used in the definition of the friend, which means that the inline friend will have the same definition in all translation unit, which includes this, this header. Okay, the demo is much like the last one. And here's a link if you want to play around with this on one box. So we are now reaching we can skip this, but uh, the, the core working group is not uh, so fancy of this technique. They think it's an abuse of the language, uh, but they don't know how to bar it yet. So we'll not go into detail there, but you can read that uh, issue if you want. Now, feature C, which is a new feature in C++20, is that they now allow the same kind of mechanism on specializations, explicit specializations that they did on explicit instantiation definitions. It says that usual access checking rules do not apply to names in a declaration of an explicit specialization. And in particular, it means that template arguments may be private types. And this makes things a lot more easier for us because with the explicit instantiations, we really need to watch our step. But if we can leverage explicit specializations, we can set up a top level type, which has a, a member class, which is not defined. And then we can use Special, explicit specializations to define these for different types of template arguments. Of course, these different types are then, as before, pointers to private data members. So if we rewrite what we had before, we can similarly use an explicit specialization of the member class of the class template access private for this private pointer to private data member F and similarly define a friend, but we don't have the same conflict here because this friend is now defined in a concrete class. Remember, this is an explicit specialization. So this can't be redefined differently. This is like a unique function just related to this guy. And as soon as we put it here, it is defined. We don't need any instantiation because it's an explicit specialization. And Christian asks, why have we introduced this loophole in the first place? And why have they expanded in C20? And the proposal actually write this, all the compilers we have tested with already allow this. So uh, since we have that compiler variance, why not allow it? I haven't read into more details on the origin of the proposal, but this is, it's not well formed per se in C++17, but it will work on all compilers you try. Okay. Uh, Somebody's asking, uh, Oleksi is asking, is it not a security flaw? Uh, I think we can always ask uh, Herb Sutter, what uh, abusing the access mechanisms? 
of the language. And he's, he's usually referring to the Machiavellistic people or language lawyers that, I mean, the language is designed uh, to be stable, but if you want to break it, you can always break it. I think a security flaw would be a code that would allow this to actually, I mean, that would allow one to leverage mechanisms as these to actually get some security critical information. But uh, I don't think the mechanism in itself is a language flaw, but I'm not perhaps the best person to say that. But even Herb, he says that no language can be designed to not have this kind of loopholes. He might not be right, but I, I can uh, post a link to that one also. Uh, to Herb Sutter's got a 67 or something. Okay, you have a demo here if you want to play around with it. Okay, and we will just simply before we end, compare the 17 approach on the right with the 20 approach on the left. Specialization makes it much better for us because we can have a single type on the top and then we just have a specialization of that top level type for every specific member of a specific type that we want to access. Whereas in 17, we had to set up a different class template for every specific member of a specific types, right? So if you had two different classes with five members each, you would need to have 10 class templates. Here you have 10 specializations instead. All right. Uh, now things are happening in the chat. Yeah, I think it's mostly comments to the last questions. I think we will skip the bonus slides and, and uh, wrap up. The bonus slides is just about making a macro lib out of this. Uh, we can just see how it can be used. Oops. But you can always have a look at my access private uh, GitHub project where you can use these uh, macros to, to simply define your, your accessors. This has only been focusing on data members because it might be useful if you want to do fault injection. But uh, I think we will wrap up there and uh, See if there are any more questions before we leave over to Callum. Great, yeah. I think we can uh, give some space now to people. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want or just write in the chat. I can mention meanwhile that these three features are based on three blog posts on my blog if you want to read more details uh, than what I presented in the presentation. And I can, uh, oh, no, I can uh, post a link in the chat after I'm done when color starts. What made you exploring those uh, C plus plus twenty features? I guess we all have uh, our different interests. I, I think it's fun to, to dig in the standard to understand mechanisms that are not particularly useful all the time. But I think the journey to try to understand them usually teach me a lot. And I don't know if people have seen my eyes. Maybe it's because I've been reading too much on the partial ordering <laughs> of function templates. So, no, for me, it's, it's more of an instructive journey. Uh, I have one question. Uh, yes, please. Right okay. So the question is, uh, it is really interesting and exciting that the language is progressing uh, with the new things and the requirements that you know the current world is facing. So I'm happy in terms of the development and the feature and the way the language is pulling in new features and working towards that to satisfy that goal. But uh, simultaneously, the uh, con or the side effect of this is we now have too many things in the language. So then, then the owners becomes like uh, because so I was working for a client where we had a document which which was a coding style document we can say and it speci it specifically was mentioning what all things not to do in c++ and that was really interesting because at every other company where i worked i worked in c language and uh, they have different you know like 80 line limit or all those kinds of tabs indentations function structuring and all those kinds of um, you know arrangement or coding style but this document was specifically for not what to not use and it was a huge document believe me it was not a small small one and i was like really surprised so what is your opinion suggestion or experience or viewpoint on this i i think uh, many in here probably have a very good views on this and i think we all agree that the language is uh, becoming very large but it has a long history 
but at least from Sensex view, since we are working with safety critical development, we have for a long time uh, when we were senior, we were actually using C plus plus O three because we are falling back on this standard called MISRA, as I mentioned in the start, and now AUTOSAR, and it's it's actually a standard that imposes limitations on the language, meaning you only use a subset. For example, we have it's a challenge in embedded to use uh, heap allocations, uh, even if you have a POSIX like system, because it will run for a very long time and you can have all kinds of heap fragmentation and challenges. So I think there are standards out there for supplementary standards that many static analysis tools uh, enforce. And I guess my summary is that we can always use a subset of C++, even if it's not as fun, but we should always make sure to have a static analysis tool that enforces it. And the best is if we can use a common standard such as MISRA. I know that MISRA is now working together with the core working group uh, and the library evolution group, or maybe it was, no, the, the SG23, I think, which is the, the, is it the safety, safety critical group or something, but it's, it's good to see that MISRA is, is on the same page and getting support for the, from the core working group to, to try to specify a subset of C++ that is considered safe. Maybe someone else has something else to add here. Good question. Yeah, thanks for your answer. Really answers my question as well. Uh, it's an interesting and a nice way to make progress that, you know, such standards are working with the core group and then things can be included in the language as well going forward. But yeah, and thanks. And the, that sounds like a perfect working solution as of now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do we have anything else or should we leave over to Kalle? Yeah, I think we can uh, go further. I mean, uh, if people uh, get other questions, feel free to uh, just unmute yourselves or, or right here. Thank you so much, uh, David, for your yeah. presentation. Very interesting.